So it's this week that a lot of people are talking about what happened on that incident called Katrina. It was a horrible, horrible hurricane, and we have to talk about this. Because I know every, everybody talks about Katrina and what happened with Katrina, but it goes beyond that. Because it, forget the hurricane. It was horrible. And I saw some of the most horrible things I've ever seen in my life. And to this day, from time to time, I get up in the middle of the night and I'm almost in tears thinking about what I witnessed in that storm. I saw and heard children and addicts that I was not able to get to, and I know they perished. And I saw bodies floating by me as I was covering the storm. You see, I was one of the very first persons to get to the scene in Katrina because I just happened to be the guy on the midnight shift at CNN. There was this hurricane coming, but nobody really cared because it was only a Category 3. And usually Category 3 hurricanes and weekends, it's not a 5. This thing's going to even slow down some more, and it's probably not going to do so much damage. Until it did. Until the world found out, and I happened to be the guy who told the world, because it was 2.30 in the morning, and I was anchoring on the news on CNN all over the world, our signal was being carried. Usually CNN signs off at noon, but they said, no, just in case that hurricane turns into something, we better leave somebody in the air. And then they looked at me and said, Sanchez, you, you, you're the Cholo, you're the Oye, you're the Latino, you're, you're, you get the graveyard shift. Nobody else wants it. Anderson Cooper, go home. Sanchez, you, go over there and just start talking for the next three hours because you know, and describe what happens with the hurricane. We don't think it's going to be much, but just in case something happens. And then, and then, this happened. According to the vice president of uh, Tulane University Hospital, Karen Troger Caraway, who we just spoke to, there is a levy that has been breached. Did you hear that? That was me, 17 years ago, going on the air at 2.30 in the morning, announcing that a levy had been breached in New Orleans. I didn't even know what's, how significant that was at the time because there's a lot of levees there. But it was the levy to Lake Pontchartrain. It was the levy that would eventually bust after other levees busted, which would eventually mean that soon after I said that, all of New Orleans would be underwater and thousands of people would be dying and drowning. And it started with that one little comment right there where the dude on the graveyard shift, you know, the little... Oye, the little Latino, the guy who was given the job that nobody wanted, went on the air and said that. And the next day, CNN said, well, now you got to continue. So they put me on a plane and they sent me to New Orleans and I started just doing all kinds of stories on things I never in my wildest dreams imagined I would ever see like this. This afternoon, help finally arrived. A row of amphibious vehicles loaded with relief supplies rolled through the flooded waters of downtown. Their destination, the convention center. A full week after the hurricane brushed New Orleans, others are still waiting to be rescued. And finally, we spot the rooftop where the chopper was leading us. The white flag signals the way and brings us to the evacuees, who we bring out one by one, all thankful to finally be out. What country are you from? China? Turns out they're Chinese cooks from a nearby restaurant who were suddenly trapped after getting caught in the hurricane and subsequent flooding. I just wanted you to hear that because it's kind of the coverage we were doing. We just got there and we're I'm a reporter because I've got to tell people what's going on. But I also have access to a boat. And if there are people who need to get on that boat, I'm going to go save them. So I'm like, I'm doing my reporting. I'm a correspondent for CNN. I just got to the scene. I'm telling people what's going on while I'm trying to help save people. Because what the hell kind of human being am I if I'm going to be sitting there reporting on something while somebody behind me is dying or drowning, right? So the whole thing was so freaking surreal. And, and as one of the first reporters on the scene, the, I spent most of my time helping people save other people. I was just another human being who was trying to lend a hand to other human beings. And that's what I was there to do. And that's what I was kind of blessed to do. And it was an interesting story and a, and a cool story in that something was happening and we were all going to try and get through it. And it was horrible. 
When I say that I would go near houses on a boat where the water was too deep and we heard children, children, little babies crying in the attics and we tried to get some out, but I know we couldn't get all of them out. And to this day, I know that there are children who died in those attics or jumped down and tried to swim, but the water was like 13 feet and many of them didn't make it. And I always wondered whether, why did we get some out, but we couldn't get others out? And then to see people who were drowning and to see people who had drowned, it was really an, uh, you know, a heck of a story. And I've covered hurricanes all of my life because I come from South Florida. Those of us who come from like South Florida, Louisiana, the Outer Banks, Alabama, Texas, we know hurricanes. Unfortunately, as you're about to learn, a lot of the people who were heading up the national newscast, in particular CNN, the place where I worked, they didn't know crap about hurricanes because they're all from places that don't get hurricanes. And we also, we, what I also learned in that story is in many ways they don't know a lot about black people and they don't know a lot about minorities and they don't know a lot about other people who aren't like them. So what happens is they tend to then castigate them and they use words to describe them that they shouldn't use. You see, something happened for me when I was at CNN covering that story. As I just showed you, the first thing I did is I started getting on the road and doing what I do. I've been a reporter all my life. It's all I know. And that's what we talk about here in Agua Media when we share stories from a Latino experience as a reporter. But really, I'm just a reporter. I just tell stories. And I, and I, and I called New York on one particular day after I'd been there in New Orleans for a couple of days. And I said, we're getting information that there's a problem in New Orleans, especially at the Superdome, and that people are hungry and they're desperate. And we want to get there and we want to tell their stories and we want to get in front of them because this is going to be a big part of the story. How do we help these people? And you know what they told me at CNN? Do you know what I was told on the phone in that moment? by the powers that be at CNN headquarters in New York City at the Time Warner Center. They said, turn your ass around. You're not going to go cover that story. We don't have enough insurance to cover you. We're not going to take, you know, we, we can't be held liable for your, for, for your security. And I'm thinking, what are you talking about? I'm a reporter. I've been covering news my whole life. I've covered more hurricanes in my life than, than, than I could shake a stick at, than you've covered stories probably. This is some dude sitting there in New York telling me that I got to turn around. They said, yes, the story in New Orleans is too dangerous. People are looting. People are shooting. People are killing each other. This thing is out of control. I said, no, it's not. Those are not looters. Those people are just people who are going through a tough situation and they need our help. They don't need us to call them names. But they turned me around. They pulled me back because I was wanting to tell the story of people like me, people like Rick Sanchez, who grew up with his parents who only made $10,000 a year combined income. I know what poverty looks like. And I know what would happen if my mom and dad suddenly had their house either swept away or going through conditions where they didn't have enough to eat because we basically ate what my dad brought home that day in terms of money that we could buy then for food. And that's the way a lot of people are in this country. And for this guy, this dweeb to be telling me this. And then suddenly I started noticing our coverage started to change. They pulled me out, but they had a correspondent come in who said this. That the hotels are just packed. In fact, we got in late last night and there was a stream of refugees going from hotel to hotel, desperately trying to find a room. Refugees. Did you hear that term? Those are Americans. Those people were Americans. And he called them refugees. I was beside myself. They pulled me away from a story I've covered in the past. I've covered riots. I've covered hurricanes. I've covered disturbances. I've dealt with angry people. It happens. But you don't put a camera on them and then call them names. But then CNN did something even more bizarre. They did one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen in my life. 
they made an announcement to the world that they would bring in war correspondents to cover this story. They were going to pull back the rest of us who were, quote unquote, domestic correspondents, and they were going to bring in the big guns. And suddenly I saw these guys get in, get off of the C-130 that CNN that loves to cover wars, by the way. CNN loves covering wars, especially wars against people who don't look like them in places all over the world. And they brought these war correspondents in. And these are the folks who all of a sudden started filing these stories. War correspondents. And I remember they were dressed in like fatigues and they looked like they were wearing armor. And I'm thinking, you're going to go talk to somebody's grandma. The person you're going to do stories on, they're not killers. They're not rooter, r r rioters. They're not looters. They're not our enemy. They're just hungry people who happen to be black. Oh, but, but, but they came in, and, and this is the kind of stories they started filing. Listen to this. This one police officer said, we don't need police here. This needs to be a military uh, action right now. Uh, this police officer felt like this was just way too much for his police force to, uh, take, uh, to take on. As I was driving in here by myself, I mean, I, I passed several spots that were looting. Let me tell you something. A mom can't find baby formula for her baby, and she fears her baby might perish or get ill. And there's a place that used to be a store where there's now no cash register and there's no employees, and the stuff is in there rotting, and she takes it to feed her baby. She's not a looter. She's not a criminal. She's not. And if even somebody goes in there and just starts taking something because it's, you know what? That still does not require the military. We don't need to send in the Green Berets to stop people in this kind of situation where everybody's hungry and the situation is out of control because of a disaster, you know? A God-made disaster. What the hell are these people talking about? So they send in war, war correspondents. They call these people looters and rioters. Look at this next guy talking about 82nd Airborne. Carol, as those water levels drop across many parts of New Orleans, it's a painstaking task for the rescue workers. They're now faced with the task of going house by house to see if there are any survivors and also checking for the dead. Today, I spent the day with paratroopers from the 82nd Airborne Division. Today, I spent the day with the 82nd Airborne Division. Have you noticed something about these reporters? They all have English accents. So... There's a tragedy in America. Americans are dying or leaving or fleeing. Those Americans are being called refugees and the people talking about them, the people covering them are reporters from all over the world who have nothing the hell to do with our country and don't even understand our country and wouldn't know New Orleans if it bit them in the ass. And CNN in its infinite fucking wisdom decides that it's gonna bring in foreign correspondents, war correspondents in army fatigues to point their fingers at poor African-Americans living in NOLA and others, not just African-Americans, Latinos, African-Americans, whatever, poor, hell, poor non-African-Americans and non-Latinos who happen to be white Americans who just are desperate as well. And they're pointing their finger at Americans and saying, look at these people, these savages, these looters, these these, these, these criminals, these refugees, refugees, damn it to hell, man. On the, today, when we think back of, to what happened on that day, this is what we should be thinking about. This is what happened to journalism in America, where instead of covering a story with compassion, we made a decision that we were going to cover them as us versus them. Here's Nick Robertson. Not a bad guy. Nick and I will go, you know, we've covered a lot of stories together. He's one of, uh, you know, CNN's international correspondents. But again, these international correspondents only know one thing. America, war, weaponry, bang, bang, bang. Here's Nick Robertson. Nick Robertson, a senior international correspondent, brought in to New Orleans today, spent the day with police officers, filed this report. Driving into New Orleans just hours before President Bush's visit, we saw helicopters swarm through the sky and fires burn. 
This is one of the main highways coming into the center of New Orleans. It's completely deserted. A there's a fire burning over He's here. There's a, a vehicle Listen on fire. Him. And over here, there's another huge fire blazing away. Difficult to tell what it is. There appears to be oh, a yeah. residential, perhaps, hard is. industrial area down there. He makes it sound like there's bombs going off. There's a war going on. Oh, my God, I just came into the city. I see the 82nd Airborne helicopters, and now I'm looking over here, and I see a fire. Yeah, it's a fire. Somebody has a fire at their house. It happens in cities, and especially in big cities, Nick. But he's, he, you know, what did we always learn? To a hammer, everything's a nail. To a war correspondent, everything's a war. So you put a war correspondent in NOLA, and they don't see poor people desperately dealing with a very horrible natural disaster. They, they see a war. And they only know how to talk about people as if they're Iraqis or Afghanis or our enemies. <sighs> Finally, look, look, listen, listen to this CNN international correspondent flown in from who the hell knows where, somewhere in the Middle East or something. Um, I think this is a fellow from Africa. Again, not a bad guy. I mean, we were all together. I got to know him and everything. But look at the way he's covering this thing. Look, listen to me. What we saw, Aaron, is like walking into a refugee camp in a third <sighs> world country. The stench, the smells, the sights, the sounds, the numbers. Even the soldiers on the ground, Aaron. The only thing that was missing was the aid workers. That, my friends, is the disgusting, deplorable way that CNN brought to America Hurricane Katrina. That's how they covered it. That's what they called them. That's how they referred to those people. It's shameful. I'm ashamed that I was even a part of it. There's a Peabody Award that CNN somehow got for that, and I was named in that award. It's not my crowning glory as a journalist or as a human being. I think I did my job. I started out well, and then they pulled me back because I wasn't making it sound horrible enough. Well, there's one more. And before I bring in my guest, who's going to have a hell of a lot to say about this, I promise you, I want you to hear one more. This is Wolf Blitzer describing, in his words, the situation in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina. We see that picture over and over and over again. As much as you see that picture, though, you, you, you simply get chills every time you see these poor individuals as Jack uh, Cafferty just pointed out, uh, so tragically, so many of these people, almost all of them that we see are so poor and they are so black, and this is gonna raise lots of questions for people who are watching this story unfold. I'm not sure what he meant by so poor and so black. I, I'm, I'm left to guess whether he was trying to point something out, but I think we're, you know, and I, and I don't want to be one of those guys who puts on stuff without context, but there's context missing there. There's a lot more to what those people were experiencing than the color of their skin. It was a situation that they were in. It's a situation that we should have dealt with from their need base, not the color of their skin base. But, you know, look, it is what it is. And sometimes we think it's only certain networks that pick on certain minorities or, uh, you know, that don't give us our due. No, no. It's all of them in many ways. And this is the prime example. And joining me now uh, to talk about this is uh, none other than Hawk Newsom, um, a lawyer, one of the uh, actually one of the co-founders of uh, Black Lives Matter of uh, Greater New York City. And he, he's been involved in this cause, but it's not because, you know, he wears his color on his sleeve or he's not the kind of person, oh, I'm only for black. No. You know, the thing about, if you talk to Hawk, the thing about Hawk is he just wants to help people who aren't getting their due, you know? And yes, too often it is African-Americans. And in the case of New Orleans, it happened to be a majority African-American community that really got treated like shit. I, I, I can only say, Hawk, after listening to that panoply of videos that I just played for you and for our listeners, what do you think? Well... Thanks for having me. I'd rather be on no other show discussing Hurricane Katrina. We have to take a step back and look at this as black problems versus white problems. Hmm. When black people have problems, they are criminalized. When white people have problems, they are victimized. So moving away from Katrina, 
just to draw an analogy. Yep. If you look at the the the, the opioid crisis and crack or heroin, when it was in our communities, it was a war on drugs, right? When it was white people in people being uh, 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 white people abusing drugs, it was an opioid crisis. Oh they needed God. healthcare. We wow. needed the era of mass incarceration. This is the way America moves. Why? Because America has a disconnect with the humanity of all non-white people. And folks could sit back and say, oh, this is a black problem, this is a brown problem. But white supremacy always makes a stop at your door if you're non-white. It just happens. So, you know, I, I was a little bit younger during Katrina, but I remember this, 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 this one illustration by the New York Times. And it was black people up to their neck in water. Yeah. And there were like these tears coming out of their eyes. I had a friend draw that picture and I kept it in my college dorm room. I kept it on my desk at work. I'll never forget how they treated us. And the news coverage wasn't, uh, it wasn't all about how the government failed us. Mm. It was all about how terrible of people we are. We're, we're rioting, we're looting. <laughs> well, you take food and, and water away from anyone and you see what they divulge to. Right. It's, 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 it's unbelievable. But it, what, do, it, what do you it, think it, of what do you think of that story I told about how I couldn't wait to go cover a story? This is what I've done. By the way, I'm an American. I, I know Nola. I know hurricanes. I know how to cover this type true. of story. And they literally told me, Hawk, no, we don't want you to cover this story. It's too dangerous. We're bringing in war correspondents on a C-130 from who knows where from all over the world. I mean, what do you think of that? What, what the hell were they saying to me? I like to make these these circumstances, uh, uh, I like to liken them to everyday circumstances. When we're out there and we're saying we don't need more police, we need more community involvement. Why? Because the community knows how to treat people. You would have went up in there with empathy. Yeah. You would have said, hey, I know what it's like to be poor. I understand where you're coming from. I want to help you. And you wouldn't have gave them that spin that they needed. You wouldn't have gave them mm. the black, poor, destitute, refugee spin. Mm. You would have humanized the people. And America has a problem with humanizing us because if you humanize black people, then you have to be held accountable for the wrong you've done to these black people time and time again. It took FEMA, what, three days to get on the ground there? Yeah. It was... Three days. We're not talking about South Korea. We're not talking about <laughs> South America. We're talking about down south. We're talking about Louisiana and the United States of America, and they couldn't get our people aid. You think if it was a, if it was if it was a, if it was Iowa? So you think so? So so it's. I'm hearing you say it's almost a perception issue with us as a nation, and this point you make is so good. You know. I got to tell you, Hawk, you got me. I'd never put these two together. When it was a black people drug problem, it was the war on drugs. When it was white Southerners with a drug problem, it was the opioid crisis. Son of a bitch, man. That's brilliant. That's actually, anybody will understand that. You could be right wing, left wing, conservative, liberal, green, black, Hispanic, what... Anybody understands what you just said there, and that is so true, my friend, that we look at things through two different lenses. Is it because is it because we're inherently bad? Is it because we're inherently racist or inherently discriminatory? Or is it because we just uh, uh, don't get it? How, how, how would you answer that? Here's the thing. America gets it. White America gets it. Uh -huh. We live in a society that is dominated by white greed and white power, okay? So it perpetuates itself off of oppressing those people who are non-white. Um, to take it, just let me just slow all the way down, bro. Yeah. Let me slow all the way down. Mm -hmm. Black people, brown people are subhuman in America's eyes. Hmm. They, they showed it during Katrina. They showed it during the crisis at the border. They weaponized us. CNN weaponizes our, our, our blackness, our melanin, right? Mm -hmm. So when President Obama 
had people in cages at the border. Oh, it's, 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 you know, it's, 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 it's Amer- the American way. Go through the immigration process. Yeah. When Donald Trump did it, he was a demon, right? But they're both doing the same thing. We can't find solace in either party, hmm. right? What we're fighting for is crumbs off the table. And, and, and you look at the war in Ukraine, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and there's everybody's going crazy and everybody wants to help Ukraine. Mm-hmm. But you look at what's happening in Tigray, in Ethiopia, mm-hmm. there's a genocide occurring. Women are being raped, babies are being killed, and nobody cares. Yeah. When it's white people being harmed, America rushes to the aid and there are white tears everywhere. But when it's us, it's like, oh, it's happening to them. Nobody wants to say it, but it's the truth. How do you get that message out without people thinking you're just too angry? Look at you. You're angry, Hawk. You need to, like, chill, baby. We can work this out, right? How many times haven't you heard that? Um, yeah, I, I, you know, my Black Lives Matter organization is not part of Global Network. Right. I don't play ball with the Dems. I, I'm, I'm not going to go on and I'm not going to say the things they like to hear. I'm going to say the truth. Right. Mm-hmm. Joe, Pi- Joe Biden just remixed uh, the crime <laughs> bill of 1994 and he plans on sending tons of black people to jail. Mm-hmm. They don't want me to say that. They want me to say, oh, black people are shooting each other and there's black on black crime. But if you look at what causes the crime in our communities and you look at black people, you look at brown people, we live in the same communities. We eat the same food. You know what I mean? Like, it's nothing for me to go into a cuchiquito in order to roast compoyo. And right. Like, that's it's our cultures interact. Right. That's but, why that's why it's 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 remarkably important that people understand that it shouldn't be about choosing a party. It shouldn't be about choosing a particular ideology and somehow hitching your wagon to it. It's about independent thinking. It's about realizing where the truth really lies and then even studying it because somebody else might break it down for you a little bit. So but very few of us are doing that these days. It's like we're living in silos, man. It's, It's the problem is the truth. If you knew the truth, you would be angry, too. Right. If, if people actually did the research and understood how, 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 how black people have been treated in America and America has done the absolute minimum to make up for it, they'd be mad, too. Hiroshima uh, reparations, the Holocaust reparations, indigenous Native American people were paid and given land. Black people save the U.S. economy through our labor. Yes. There would be no America without black people. Right. And when, it, when it's time to, to ask for reparations, they don't want to cut us a check. If, if you look at what happened with Katrina, they showed us exactly how much they care about us. Black people were appalled. They were hurt. But in all honesty, they couldn't say that they were surprised because that's how America treats us. They so so, so that's suffer. interesting. What you're saying is that somehow Katrina is the story of my generation and your generation probably as well that kind of let the cat out of the bag. It's like, yes. you know, you would think CNN, for example, they're not, they're the good guys, right? It's not like they're right wing nuts or anything. They're going to yeah. do the right thing. But when push came to shove, they didn't. They didn't. That's it. That that is it. You and, and you hit the nail on the head when you said the cat came out of the bag. It always happens in America. America always shows you just how racist it is. Uh, you look at Rodney King. You look at Katrina. You look at the Black Lives Matter movement. They try and pacify us, but eventually the truth will come to the light, and the light is America's anti-black. But what good does it do us to call out their racism or their discriminatory nature if that's only going to divide us more, I would ask? The, the problem is we are always divided. We are never united. It's just sometimes we highlight the division. And when we highlight the division, they say that we are angry. Mm-hmm. When somebody kills us repeatedly on television and we go out and tear some shit down, Mm. Right. They call us angry. But if people would have helped us, if people would have adhered to the warnings and the cries for help in the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement, there would have never been a George Floyd. Right. And if you look around politically at what laws were passed around the country after George Floyd, 
They were all things we've been advocating for since Eric Gardner. It's a joke. So when we highlight these things on the news, it's just to raise awareness of our people. I'm done trying to convince white people that racism exists. They know that it exists and it works for them. And if saying that makes me an angry black man, then I'll be a furious black man. <laughs> I get your point. Um, let me ask you a question, and this gets a little controversial as well. When you go back and you read history of African-American communities in the United States, there were at times, some 30, 40 years ago, some unbelievably productive, thriving African-American communities throughout the United States in many of the big cities. Overtown, only because I happen to be talking from South Florida right now, was one of those. And for the most part, the key measure of that community was it was very self-sustaining. That's not to say people from that community didn't go outside of their community, but for the most part, there was a butcher there and a hardware guy there and a store owner there and there were merchants and it was a self-sustaining community. And like mm -hmm. Overtown, there are a bevy of others all over the United States. And then somehow those communities became divided or dissipated or in the case of Overtown, they decided to run I-95 right right between it and basically destroy the cohesion of the town. You mean white supremacy happened to these towns? Say that again? White supremacy, white supremacy happened to these thriving white communities. If you're going to talk about Overtown, you might as well talk about Tulsa, Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Self-sustaining, black community, black Wall Street. They burned down Tulsa. They, they burned down black Wall Street, and they actually dropped bombs out of planes on American soil on this thriving black community. It happens time and time again. But here's Every but here's time. but here's my point, Hawk, and this is where I think it's it becomes a little uh conflictive, if not uh almost controversial. Is it possible that in our effort to try and make us all the same, um, we lost that sense of entrepreneurship that once existed in the African-American community. In other words, is it possible that by trying to um, make African-Americans live in the white world, for lack of better terms, which I'm sure you and I could come up with because we're both smart guys, we actually depressed the African-American community. It was better off being self-sustaining, I guess, is the argument that I'm making. Just like towns here in South Florida do well because all the Cubans kind of stick together and certain parts of, you know, uh, Asian communities in San Francisco do well because they kind of stick together. Do you get my drift? Desegregation was one of the worst things that ever happened to black people. Interesting. Martin Luther King said that right before he killed him. He said, I fear that we've integrated into a burning house. The problem is when they desegregated our communities, all of the black lawyers, the black doctors, the black merchants moved out to live amongst white people who did not want them. Instead of staying home and making our communities great, it's very problematic because if we would have just fought for more resources for our communities, that's what I fight for. I mm. fight for more resources for our communities. Then we could have thrived. We don't have to live amongst white people. We don't have to ex be accepted by white people to thrive. I'm sorry. If you look at communities that, that have done really well in community, you look at the Asians, you look at the Jews, they're very much insulated. C Cubans, right? Cuban Americans in South Florida Cuban. are very insulated. Insulated. Yeah. But somehow black people, it's been driven in our heads that to make it is to make it out of our communities. So you take the cream of the crop and you move them out. And then what, what, what people are stuck with are those people who are struggling to survive. Um, I always say it, crime is caused by desperation and poverty. If your child is starving and your lights are cut off, nobody can tell you not to break the law. I'm mm. sorry, right? Nobody can tell you not to sell a drug or not to steal something. You have to survive. Right. So what we teach is black. Well, I started a new organization called Black Opportunities, and it's all about black empowerment from the ground up. Yes. And just I just want to throw this in there. They, the mayor of New York City called me out and said, you really care about black lives. You do something about the black violence and the shootings. We went into Harlem every day this summer with kids games, free books, free food and good music. 
every single day. In our targeted communities, shootings are down 30 percent, but no one will talk about it. Interesting. It, it stands to reason, though, right, that if, if, if you have, uh, you know, a baker and a plumber and a candlestick maker and a banker, you literally are creating a community that can feed off of itself. When one or two of those entities are pulled out and we say from now on, if you want to go to a baker, you got to go to some white dude who's a mile and a half away. If you want to go to a candlestick or you want to buy a candlestick, you got to go over there. If you need a grocer, you can't do it from your own. Once that happens, just as a business guy, I'm a business guy. I, I believe in being able to uh, forge businesses. And it seems to me, once you take that out, you got nothing left. And, and I think that yeah. happened in America somehow, and I'm not sure why. Here's the thing, Rick. When everybody left, or when all the black talent left, white people came in and filled the void, right? Hmm. So now you have white folks and other folks who come into our communities and benefit. We make money, we send it right back out to other communities, right? I wanna see a, a, a black person going up, open up a shop in Chinatown. I wanna see me go and open up a business in a Hasidic community. <laughs> no one would patronize me. But right. when a black person opens a, a bodega even in the Bronx, it's a big deal, right? Uh -huh. it's, it's, it's foreign for us to own businesses in our own communities. Which, so, right, which, which is the way it should be. I mean, I, a, a person from outside of my community, unless they specialize in a certain kind of food, obviously an Asian restaurant should be an yeah. Asian, whether they're in a Cuban community or a black community. You know, a guy who does soul food down here from Overtown or Liberty City wants to come into my area and do it, it would be welcome because it's a specialty. But you can't come in here as a plumber and all of a sudden put up your shingle and expect that everyone's going to run to you. It's quite oh. the opposite. You kind of got to work your way out as an industry. And th th that's what African-Americans were never given a chance to do. That's the spirit of entrepreneurship that I think somehow was ripped away from them back in the 1940s and 50s and 60s. Yeah, with desegregation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's like, it's, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. Like I look at, so let's say Chinese restaurants, Asian restaurants, sure. right? People will say I'm promoting hate for simply telling this truth. I've been in those little Asian takeout restaurants across the country in mm -hmm. black neighborhoods. There is not a black employee in there. Yeah. So not only do we allow people to make money for us from off of us, we are not even holding them to accountable to, 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 to hire our own people. Yeah. It's a whole mindset, man. You don't see the shackles, right? Mm -hmm. They're here. Like, like we're, we're still in slavery in our minds. Like, those are the chains that we have to break. So it's psychological. You know how many apathetic people there are out here? And, 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 and I don't put the blame on the people. There are systems. When we say systemic racism, I don't have to run through the gamut. But there are systems that keep them right where they are. Why? If, if education is the key and Black folk had to... And black folk were killed for learning how to read during slavery. Now reading is not cool. All of our schools suck. There's a 60% dropout rate in our communities. And, and that's not our fault. Like, that's the system. This system is geared off black and brown people. It's yeah. all about ownership, really. I mean, think about a police officer who walks his beat or works a certain area where he is from. The idea that we are now living in a country where police officers are shipped into communities, it goes back to what I was just talking about with CNN, bringing in foreign war correspondents with British accents to cover a situation about a natural disaster in an American city. When I go to certain parts of the United States and I go into these inner cities in particular and I talk to the police officers, None of them are from the inner city. They don't know Mabel who lives in the corner. They don't know Joe who runs the grocery store. They have no idea who the hell these people are. How who can they then police them properly? Bro? Who shaped their opinions on black people? The CNNs, the MSNBCs, the Fox Newsers, they watched us being portrayed as animals yeah. their whole lives. And then they go into our communities to fight these dangerous 
animals. Like it's really, really obscene. And it's, it's, it's ridiculous the way we are portrayed in the media. But the problem is we are not unified, yeah. right? Unified, a unified people is a strong people and it's hard to oppress a unified people. So um, we just have to find ways to um, unify ourselves in spite of. So the average African-American who kind of makes it, whether it's a LeBron James or an Oprah or whoever, name your favorite uh, African-American, quote unquote, famous rich person. Um, they, 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 they'll, they'll pretend they're giving back because they're doing these foundation things, which by the way, they get a great tax break from. Not for nothing, wink, wink, but you know, uh, I happen to know because I know how those things work. That's different than actually going back into your community and working it from within. Now, I want to be fair to LeBron because I'm, I'm, I've read that he actually has done some of this. No? LeBron's working with the right people. Okay. The problem is folks are giving back. Hip-hop guys and these athletes are giving back, but they're doing it the wrong way. They're doing it with these organizations that promote white supremacy, meaning hmm. they're doing it in a way where they're really not pushing black people in the direction that they need to go in. Uh, if, 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 let's so what is the direction they need to go in? Is it back to create entrepreneurial communities, teach people how to be a business that, person, how to yeah, run a school, yes. those kinds of yes, things? Yes, but our, our leaders are too busy running around begging white people, right? Uh -huh. Your NAACPs, your Al Salvador, oh, give me my rights, give me my rights. When you offend white people like those <laughs> folks in Michigan, they went to the state capitol with guns. Yeah. Okay, when, when you offended <laughs> Trump America, you went and raided the yeah. nation's capital, right? They don't want black people to have that type of energy because then there'll really be change. Um, LeBron has the right people around him. Um, there's Magic so Johnson, many... same thing. Look, I, you, you look at the NAACP, right, in their mm. relationship with Joe Biden in, a in the Democratic Party, yeah. they'll come out and they'll say, hey, you shouldn't say that, Joe, but they'll rally the vote around them, yeah. right? They're like, okay, there's a Republican. We have to beat the Republicans, so let's just give the Democrats our votes. I'm going to tell you, I'm gonna tell you a story. I want, I want to share a story with you that I think you're going to find interesting. When I was the main anchor at CNN, and I've told this story before. In fact, we did a whole podcast about this. And you guys will find it if you go to Spotify or if you go to uh, uh, Apple and, and, and go to Agua Media or go to Rick Sanchez News and, and go back in the library of the podcast we've done and you'll see that one. It's about Lou Dobbs. So I was working at CNN and there was this dude named Lou Dobbs and he was saying the most horrific things about Latinos. He was saying that all the Mexicans coming over the border had syphilis and AIDS and we, they were diseased and they were destroying the country, taking everyone's jobs. And then Joe Arpaio in Arizona was arresting them. And there was this, just this, you remember, you're, you're old enough yeah. to remember. There was this whole Absolutely. hate, hate Mexicans, get all the, round up all the Mexicans, kill all the Mexicans thing. And this guy was on CNN doing a show saying this shit. I was like beside myself. So I marched my ass up to the president of CNN and I said, this has to stop. What he's saying is against my mom and my father, all right? And, and they're not stealing from this country and they do pay their taxes and they're not on welfare and stop this crap. And I, and I thought I had an audience and then all of a sudden, the National Association of Hispanic Journalists had its convention. And I thought, I being the guy at CNN who was sticking up for my Latino brothers and sisters, would be called and given an opportunity to speak at this conference, at this Latino journalist convention. Hawk, you know what they did? CNN gave them a check for $100,000 and they had Lou Dobbs, the biggest anti-Latino, Mexican-hating newscaster on their air, was given the role of keynote speaker at that conference. And I sat my ass in the back with everybody else. And, and I thought of that story with something that you just said about how oftentimes we have these organizations. I can't speak ill of the NAACP, but I can tell you what those, what my own brothers did mm -hmm. to me at the Come National on. Association Absolutely. of Hispanic Journalists. Absolutely. You know? And they sat there and clapped for them. I have a CNN story. 
Actually, it was the day after the election when mm-hmm. Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton. Yeah. And um, we had this whole campaign going called I Ain't Voting Until Black Lives Matter. We placed a list of demands on the Democratic Party and said, if you want our vote, you'll have to earn it. So they called me in to Don Lemon, right? Mm-hmm. So we're sitting there. And I said, the reason Hillary Clinton lost was because she took advantage of black people. Because she went out and got black celebrities and, mm-hmm. and put them in front of us instead of giving us concrete uh, 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 agenda, yeah. uh, uh, concrete plans. And they looked at me like I had three heads, but I told no <laughs> lies. Like, how dare you? The black celebrity thing works for everybody. Why do you want to rock the boat? No, mm-hmm. what other culture are the spokespeople, athletes, and entertainers? Yeah. And I will not accept it. I never got called back to CNN. I was they, just they, gonna they, say, I was just gonna <laughs> say, Hawk, I bet you that was your only time on CNN. Yeah, they, now they'll run my stories. Like like when Donald Trump accused me of treason <laughs> or when the mayor was fighting with me, they'll run my stories. But they won't. They won't have me on. It was really funny. But isn't that it's funny? Cool. But but think about what you just said, my friend Hawk. What you just said is, if you don't say what they want to hear, then they'll only invite someone next time who does just what they want. That Absolutely. is not journalism. That is not truth. And that's not really shaping or improving the national conversation for all people who live in this country. Not one bit, my friend, not one Um, bit. Funny, when I, so the mayor said he was bringing back the same police unit that killed uh, Eric Garner, Sean Bell, Amadou Diallo, those famous cases. Eric Garner, who made the, who committed the horrible, sinful, vicious crime of selling one cigarette. Absolutely, that they couldn't tax. <laughs> what cigarette? <laughs> that America couldn't tax. Can you think, just imagine, just forget everything else, yeah. forget everything else you saw. A human being was on a street corner selling a cigarette for yes. 20 cents, and he ended up dying on that street at the hands of police. Just that alone is worth asking, how in the hell does that even happen? How does that escalate? But that's another story you were gonna, you and I are gonna do on another day. Continue your story. I apologize. So this unit, they kill Eric Garner for selling cigarettes. They killed Sean Bell the, the, at his bachelor party the night before his wedding. Neither of whom were armed, and a number of other high-profile cases. He said he was going to bring those back. Two previous mayors disbanded this unit for being too violent. And I said, you know, if you bring them back, there'll be riots, fires, whatever, because if he bought them back. They were going to hurt somebody, and these things were going to happen. So um, Anderson Cooper, he went. the mayor went viral because of this fight. He was on Anderson Cooper. He was yeah. on Colbert. So Anderson Cooper is sitting there like, oh, some abstract BLM group. I was like, you m He <laughs> had our. He had the president of, 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 of our organization, our former president, on 60 Minutes, right? And, and, and he interviewed the president of our specific group. And now we're like some abstract group. Why? Because we criticize you? Because we won't let you continue to buy out and manipulate black people? No, no way. A change is coming. It's not only on the horizon, it's right here in front of us. And we're changing the way things are. So global. Displays- so, so what you're saying is global Black Lives Matter has, in your opinion, not... Um, espoused the true nature and the true ideology of what Black Lives Matter really should represent, which is to help people who are on the streets who Black are liberation. going through oppression. That's your point, right? Black liberation. The problem is they call me to the table and they said to me, well, you know, our donors are uncomfortable with some of the things you were saying, right? right. So then they denounced me. So it's not a, it's, they, they, they fight for Black people to an extent until the white people who give them money are uh, made uncomfortable. That's a fascinating, that's a fascinating, uh, relevatory piece of information. I, I, I didn't know that, uh, but I guessed, knowing yeah. my own community and others, that that type of thing often happens when someone just wants to get what's good for them, not what's good for the group. 
And exactly. Uh, unfortunately, like, this is that's historic, man. Man, listen, you you know how hard we fight for funding. Like literally, this summer of hope, we it cost us about ninety thousand dollars, and we didn't receive one donation over twenty five thousand dollars. It's all ten dollars, twenty dollars, thirty. It's people who watch us on social media that believe in our work, that that empowered us with their dollars to go out and literally decrease violence in black communities. <laughs> Meanwhile, a man last week gave $1.6 billion to the Federalist Society and the Republican Party. Come on, man. Listen, you know why white supremacy Let, works? You want me to give you that number again? $1.6 billion political donation. Wrap your head around that number. They understand how this game works. We don't. They understand if you want liberation, if you want your way in America, you have to plan. You have to make long, drawn-out plans, and you have to fund those plans. Our people don't get that, bro. And it's amazing speaking. I, I have a few. Like, we have Dominicans in our organization. My right-hand man, who run, we, are, we actually own a school. Who runs yeah. our school is a Puerto Rican brother. Right. So um, the Latinos that get it, get it yeah. in the same way they see their brothers and sisters selling them out. It's the same way our brothers and sisters sell us out. Right. And that really makes us uh, uh, I feel like I'm talking to a revolutionary, bro. Like, well, like you, you know, have revolutionary and, and, thought. Patterns. And, and I think sometimes the reason guys like you and I understand each other and while we may not agree on all things, we have a basic principle of understanding is because we Latinos come from countries where we've seen this show play out. We've seen these types of things happen. And we've seen that oftentimes the forces that come from outside our countries are the ones that cause those problems. And they have a lot to do with green, not the color of your skin, but the color of the money that allows people to sell their souls you know, despite the needs of their own people. So that, 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 that's in our blood. That, that's that's yeah. where we come from as Latinos who happen to be living in the United States of America. And that's why there should be uh, a certain kinship when it comes to these types of conversations, Hawk. Absolutely. And what, what you've seen in your countries are revolutions. Anytime Black people get riled up and ready, they appease us. Mm -hmm. And we slow down, right? Mm -hmm. Once they give us a little bit, make a few promises. Or they appease the right <laughs> ones. <laughs> Think about it. This is what they're doing. Like they have a list, right? And in that list, they're probably saying, well, we got to get to that guy and that guy and that gal and that guy and that guy. And if we get them, we subjugate the whole group. And, and, and that's, that's probably, you know... I guess the smart way to do it. Um, Absolutely. It's not the kind way to do it. It's not the right way to do it. But um, as we have this conversation, I can see why stuff like that matters. Um, <laughs> Hawk, uh, thanks for being with us. Thanks for this great conversation. Thanks for you know bringing us so many realities of the way things really are as opposed to what we see when we turn on the uh, talking box. <laughs> Hey, I, I appreciate you. Um, I, I appreciate this discourse. And like you said, we might not agree on many things, but there are truths that no one can deny. And those are some of the things that sometimes can bring us together. And that's a good starting place. So, and a good ending place in this case. This is uh, Agua Media. This is Rick Sanchez News. You can find this podcast on Spotify or on Apple or wherever you get your podcast. And do me a favor. I mean, if you hear it and you think somebody else should hear this conversation, like the one that Hawk and I just had, do me a favor, share it with them. Just pass it along, hit that little share button, and then just put their email address or whatever and get it to them because we want as many people to be a part of this conversation because without us, ain't nobody going to say these things. They just aren't. Right they, they're just not. You're not going to hear this conversation on CNN. You're not going to hear this on Fox. You're not going to hear this on NBC, et cetera, et cetera. And if you happen to be watching us on YouTube, see that little subscribe thing down there? Hit it for us, will you? We appreciate it. Hawk, I appreciate you, my friend. God bless. Thank you. All power to the people. Be well. Bye-bye. Agua.